Thank you, Seth, and good morning. I would like to uh, encourage you to come Wednesday night for this three-part series that Dr. Wallace is going to be teaching. He is, uh, I think most of you probably know, professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. He's uh, an excellent professor. He's spoken here on other issues. Uh, his, one of his specialties is uh, ancient manuscripts and the integrity of Scripture, and this is going to be a series on Romans, specifically on Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. It's a very important passage in a very important book. When I had the book of Romans from Dr. Johnson many, many years ago, that passage is one that he assigned for papers to be written. He wrote two papers in his class, and that was one that he felt was very important for us to study, and it's very important for justification the subject of justification, the doctrine of justification. And so Dr. Wallace is going to teach on that, and then he's going to, in the, 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 the three weeks or so, uh, deal with contemporary issues and some very significant ones that are challenging orthodoxy today. So I encourage you to come. It, I think it will be very beneficial for you. I know it will be. But we're in the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians, and we begin a new chapter, chapter 4, and really a new section of the book. We're going to look at chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus, that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warn you. For God is not, has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father, this is a solemn passage, and a passage that certainly was needed in the days of the Thessalonians, but one as we consider our own society today and the things that are happening, that uh, it's equally relevant for us. And so I pray, Lord, that you would prepare our minds for this time of study together and that you would, through this instruction that Paul gave, which was to arm the Thessalonians in order to deal with the temptations of their society, that you would do the same for us, that you would arm us in order that we might resist the, the spirit of this age and that we would live pure lives that honor you, that please you and glorify you before men. So Lord, bless us and build us up in the faith. Equip us for the week to come. Who knows what temptations will, will cross our path. We need to be ready for that. And so I pray that you would prepare us. And as Warren has prayed, it's so essential that we be men and women of the Word of God. If we're to be equipped for the challenges of life, whatever form they may come, 
we must be well grounded in the scriptures and the doctrines of the word of God. We need to know you and uh, live for you. So Lord, we won't do that unless we study your word. And so as we study it this morning, bless us with understanding and resolve to be faithful to you. Uh, Father, we pray for the material needs that we have as well. Some are going through difficulties of uh, matters of health or finance. You know our needs. We may not know the needs of anyone in here, but we know we all have needs. And whether we know what they are or not, we do know you know. And you know the solution. And you know what we need to go through uh, to achieve this work of sanctification that Paul speaks of in this passage. So Lord, bless, encourage, supply where it is needed and in the way that it's needed. And, and through all the experiences that we have and through the experience of our fellowship with you, may we be built up in the faith and encouraged. And, and may our result of our time together this morning be that we desire to to serve you well and bring glory to you. So we look to you to bless, build us up in the faith. Bless us as we sing our next hymn. I pray that you'd use it to prepare our time for this time of study and worship together, we pray. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. St. Francis of Assisi is often quoted as saying, Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. According to his biographers, he did that. He gave up wealth for poverty. <clears throat> what bothers me about his statement is it diminishes the need of words and importance of doctrine, which plays approvingly to many modern minds. Christianity requires study and thought. It involves words. That's Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So faith comes from hearing, not seeing, from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. So read, so speak. Still, it is true that deeds matter, and they matter a lot. James emphasized that. Faith without works is dead. If there's no fruit, there's no root, no life no reality to such a faith. The gospel that comes to us in words changes those who receive it. We have transformed lives. And that must be evident in our behavior, and it will be. It is impossible not to bear fruit when we, as branches, have been placed in the living vine, the Lord Jesus Christ, and have His life within us. Well, that is emphasized by Paul as well as James. And Paul emphasizes that at this point in his first letter to the Thessalonians. Normally, Paul treats doctrine, the subjects of theology, in the first part of his letter and then takes up what we might call practical matters or the application of doctrine to the lives of those he's writing to later on. But here he deals with Christian behavior early, before the doctrinal section. And the importance of it is evident from the language he uses to introduce it. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. Now the word finally doesn't mean this is the end of the letter. You might think that from the word. Obviously, though, we're in the middle of the book and he doesn't mean that. And so what this word finally means is probably something like for the rest and indicates a transition that Paul is making from the prayer that he just prayed at the end of ver uh, chapter 3 to a new subject the subject of Christian behavior. In fact, it, it, it marks something of a transition or shift in the book. Chapters 1 through 3 emphasize the past 
and present for the Thessalonians. In the recent past, they had turned from idols to serve the living God. A great change had taken place in their lives, and as a result of that, in the present, they were suffering trials and persecution for their faith. The rest of the book, chapters 4 through 5, emphasize the present and the future, the behavior of the Thessalonians now, and the rapture of the church in the future. Chapter 4 begins with a, a, a general statement about the Christian life. And the seriousness of that life and living it is indicated in the two words that he uses there in verse 1, request and exhort. We request and exhort you. Paul was concerned about them. They, they were his brethren. That's how he refers to them. They were his spiritual family. And so he wanted their walk to abound or excel still more. It was abounding, he suggests that, he, he says that, which is a way of saying that he wasn't writing here to correct them. This was more precautionary than corrective. But it was necessary that they understood that their walk was important, vitally important. This word walk is a, a Jewish or Hebraic way of describing a person's life. In Psalm 1, for example, David warns against walking in the counsel of the wicked. In Exodus 16 and verse 4, God told Moses that he would test the people to see if they will walk in his commandments. It's a very common way of describing a person's life, his or her behavior, the course of a person's life. A, a walk denotes that. It, it denotes progress in a certain direction. And it can be in a good or a bad direction. That's life. It has a course. It has a direction. It has a pattern. And Paul wanted the walk of the Thessalonians to be a good one. One that pleased God and honored Him before men in their behavior. That's why it is good and necessary to know who God is, which means it's good and necessary to know His Word, to study the Scriptures, and, and in so doing, learn who He is, His character, and what He has done for us, how He saved us from sin and judgment, how He is with us now, presently, and will never leave us, and will someday certainly bring us into His kingdom. And then from gratitude, we will want to please Him, which is the goal of our walk. Put another way, to glorify Him from obedience, but obedience gladly given because of all that He's given to us and all that He's done for us. He wants our obedience. That's, that's a living witness to the world of the reality of God's saving grace is seen in a changed life. People can argue against our doctrines, and they will, it's difficult for them to argue against a changed life. And that's really what these Thessalonians saw in these Christians in Thessalonica who had turned from worshiping idols to worship and serve the living God. They'd seen a significant change. And that was a real testimony to the reality of the gospel and the reality of the God that they worship. Look what he does. He changes lives. And so he wants to see that in us. He wants to see a life of obedience and service, but he doesn't want that obedience given to him grudgingly or out of a sense of mere duty. Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, You have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. How do we glorify God in our body? by obeying Him. And the best way to obey Him, the best obedience we can give to Him is obedience out of gratitude and joy. That's pleasing to Him. That's the goal of our walk with Him. And in verse 2, Paul tells them, 
he wanted them to do that in a very special way and reminded them of what he had taught them earlier when he and his companions were in Thessalonica. They taught them the need for uh, observing a high standard of moral behavior. He states it in verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Leon Morris, in his commentary, wrote, It comes as something of a surprise to modern men to find an exhortation to sexual purity in the forefront of practical directions to a Christian church. And, and it does seem odd uh, on the face of it. Uh, that, that, that would seem to go without saying that we should not live lives uh, that are morally loose. But that's to us. Uh, these were largely Gentiles who had turned to Christ from idolatry. The, the behavior that Paul warns against was common among the Gentiles. In Greek cities, sexual sin was hardly condemned and, and um, really it was engaged in freely as a natural way of behavior. Now, having a mistress was common among men of wealth and an accepted practice. That was the Gentile world. That was the pagan world, which as we think about it is not all that much different from our world as well. When Queen Anne was dying, her husband, George II, King of England, was inconsolable. He sat at her bedside and promised to always stay faithful to her, his beloved wife, even after death, despite her strong exhortations for him to marry again. George, George, you must marry again. And sobbing, George II uttered the historic words, no, I shall have mistresses. Now, I don't know if the queen threw her royal slipper at him or <laughs> simply accepted that as uh, upper class morality. But what it illustrates is the human heart's ability to rationalize anything so people can do what they please. Now, that's really every age and the spirit of the age in the world. Its influence is always on us and always felt. Whether we sense it or not, it's there. That's Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. That's why Paul is saying, don't be conformed to the world. The pressure is great. And we can become desensitized to it and, and begin to conform to it if we're not careful. And so we, we must be on guard against that. There's always been pressure what Paul is writing of here 2,000 years ago is as relevant to us today as it was to them. And as I said earlier, I think our, our society is becoming more like the society of Paul's day all the time. But the, the ways of the world were, especially, were a, 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 an especially strong influence on these new Gentile converts in Thessalonica who had just come out of all of that and a society where immorality was acceptable and expected. Now that's hard to resist. Paul knew that. He'd introduced them to a new standard of behavior, a high one, one they were still adjusting to. Nothing suggests that they'd fallen away from that. In fact, he makes the point that they were walking as they should. But he knew that he needed to remind them of this. And reminders, this whole principle of being reminded of truth is very important in the Bible. And so he's reminding them. He comes back to this issue that he knew was pressing upon them and they needed to be reminded of again, as we do as well. As I said, the Bible is current. Written 2,000 years ago, this letter was written that long ago. It's still relevant to us today. It addresses problems that we face because they're problems that are perennial. Uh, I graduated from high school in 1967. That summer is known as the summer of love. And you, I, I, this was the first time I'd heard of hippies. 
and all this stuff that was going on out in San Francisco and hate Ashbury, and you're hearing slogans like free love. Well, that didn't begin then. That, that, that slogan was popular 10 years before, 20 years before, maybe more than that. Society has, has, has uh, changed a lot in 50 years. Uh, it's every bit as permissive as it was back then. Really even more accepting of immoral behavior than ever. So we in our day need this reminder. The church has always needed this reminder. Even Puritan New England had issues with immorality. We're familiar with Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. Maybe you read it in high school. It's a fiction, but it tells the story of what really did happen, the things that were going on then just as they go on today. So Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and to us as well to say that our standards of sexual behavior are not to be taken from the world, not to be taken from society, but taken from God. And God's will for us is purity. This is part of our sanctification, Paul says. Sanctification is the, the process of making us pure or making us holy. In fact, it, it is related to the word holy, sanctification is. And basically, holy, as I've, I think I've stressed this many times, means set apart. When we were called into our new life, we were set apart by God from the world, from, from the old life to a new life, to His life, and to His service. But that, that involves increasingly being made pure or holy. That's sanctification. It is, first of all, a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. Later in chapter 5, verse 23, there is the, maybe the classic statement, classic verse on sanctification. Paul writes, Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you entirely. It is God's work. And I think he means in that, the God of peace will impart peace to your life through sanctification. And He will impart that to your life by bringing order into your life and obedience into your life. But uh, it's the work of God first and foremost. The work of God through the Holy Spirit who is the, the seal upon our hearts, who is the abiding presence within our lives. He changes us. He changes our minds. He transforms them with, with greater understanding of the things and the ways of God. He increases our desire for those ways of God and fortifies our wills to act upon that and to do them. It is a progressive work. It happens by degrees, and it is never completed in this life. We're never going to be perfect in this life. It's completed only in our glorification in the resurrection. But it is ongoing, and it is a process in which we also are engaged. Sanctif sanctification happens with our cooperation or responsive obedience to the ministry of the Holy Spirit within us. And ultimately, our, that response of ours is a product of His work within us, but we are responsible to do that. You see that, for example, in Paul's statement in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There you go. There's your responsibility. That, that implies a great deal of effort and discipline. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This is serious business. Nothing's more serious than this. But then he adds four. Here's the explanation. It is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. God is constantly at work within us to make this possible and to make it actual that we too are to work. We are to strive to be holy, to be different. That is not optional. Paul says it is the will of God. Your sanctification, and especially here, your sanctification in regard to personal morality, daily. And that expression, the will of God, opens up a whole subject. Books have been written on the subject of finding the will of God, and 
Lots of sermons have been preached on it. And often I think when we think of this subject of the will of God and determining the will of God for our lives, we focus on major decisions in life. Where, where to go to college. Uh, whether or not to change jobs. That's a hard decision for young men to make and others. Uh, when to wed and who to marry. All of those are very important decisions, sort of life-changing decisions. But the will of God is also about the daily decisions we make. In, in fact, mainly about that, which we are, are often too casual about. That's the concern of one of the commentators, uh, Michael Martin, who wrote a relatively new commentary. He wrote, I sometimes wonder why people would seek the will of God at a pivotal moment in life if they've been ignoring God's will in their daily lives. God's will is not mysterious, some hidden thing that, that we, we need some formula to obtain and perceive. It's in, the word, it's in the Word of God. It is the Word of God. It's there for us to read, to discover by simply studying the Bible. It gives us instruction on daily living. And here, in this text, it is avoid immorality. And when we follow the obvious instruction on God's will, our obedience is sometimes God's unexpected way of leading us to some unforeseen places. That's the mystery of providence. And I don't think there's any better example of that than Joseph. His path to prime minister of Egypt occurred through his refusal to yield to a woman's seduction. Really, even before that, the, the path began with obedience to his father when he sent him off on a mission to check up on his brothers who were not honest men. And he did it. He did it willingly and... Uh, with, with great concern, and as a result, you know the story, he ended up in a pit. And he went from the pit to a jail later. But it was from the pit to the jail to the throne, and where he blessed the world. Now, Joseph didn't follow some complicated formula for discerning God's will. It was simple. Honor his father. Glorify God. Be a servant wherever he was. Even in a jail, he was an excellent servant. In other words, do what is right. The Christian life is simple. And I, when I say that, I probably should qualify that. There are complexities about life and the Christian life. But in terms of what we're talking about here, it's, it's relatively simple. It requires obedience in the daily things of life. Being where we should be. Doing what we should be doing. It's just that simple. Where should you be in this hour? Where do you need to be the next hour? Be where you're supposed to be. Doing what you're supposed to be doing. Those basic decisions open up unforeseen paths for us. The will of God is a broad subject. But here it's about sanctification and specifically the sanctified life regarding morality, avoiding sexual immorality. So Paul tells the Thessalonians to do that. Abstain from sexual immorality, from fornication. Now that's the negative side of things given in an urgent kind of uh, command, a thou shalt not type command. And we need that. We need that kind of instruction. We need forceful admonitions from the Word of God, but, but not just that. And in verse 4, Paul gives the opposite side of the same command. He tells each man to know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. But what is the vessel that he's speaking of here? It has been taken by some to be his wife, treat her well. And that, that's good counsel but it seems to me that limits the circle of men in the exhortation. Now, what about those who are single? Peter does refer to the wife as the weaker vessel in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. 
But that really doesn't have any bearing on this because she is not the husband's vessel. It's not like she is some vessel that he owns. She is a vessel just as he is a vessel. Paul's reference here is most likely to the man's body. And that has a parallel in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, where Paul calls our bodies and, and refers to both male and female, the man and the woman, as earthen vessels. Well, they're earthen vessels because we're made of dust, and it describes the weakness of our, our human frame. But we're also vessels, meaning we are utensils of God, as it were. We are His servants. He uses us in His service. And so we are to be at His service. We are to understand that, and we are to be filled with Him. We are to be filled with His Spirit and His desires. These vessels should be filled up with that. So we're to be used of Him. We're to use our bodies to His glory, not our own satisfaction. We've been bought with a price. We're no longer our own. We belong to Him. So we are to possess these bodies in sanctification. Again, that's the subject. The word is used throughout this passage, this word sanctification. It's used in verse 3, it's used here, and then it's used later in verse 7. And again, basically the word sanctification means set apart. Utensils, for example, used in the service at the tabernacle and the temple were called holy because they were set apart for special use. Well, they aren't moral, obviously. They're not sentient things like we are. They're just inanimate objects, forks and fire pans and whatever other utensils that they had, plates and bowls. But they're called holy because they were separated from other plates and bowls and fire pans and whatever. They were separated for special use. They were dedicated to temple ceremonies, to religious use. And so they're holy objects. And that's illustrative of us. It makes the point that, that we are holy ones because we have been set apart, not for ourselves, but we've been set apart, separated from our old life to a new life, separated to God's life and service. And so we're engaged in that. How do we do that? How do we live out that separated life? We do it by being devoted to Him and being obedient to Him, being pure and holy. And Paul adds to that, we are to live in a way that honors the body. The body that you have is God's gift to you. It's your means of serving Him. And so we're to honor it. Immorality doesn't honor it. Immorality dishonors it. It destroys it. Paul makes that point in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. He speaks of, of sins of immorality as unique. They are sins against the body. They defile, they destroy the body. And so Paul is, is laying some stress here on the importance of the vessel we have, the body we have. That's unusual. Uh, B.F. Lightfoot, a 19th century Anglican scholar, pointed out that that is unusual, that this emphasis on honoring the body is one of the great contrasts between Christianity and heathen philosophy, uh, specifically Greek philosophy. The Greeks despised the body. Now, they despised the body um, intellectually, philosophically, but no doubt they took care of their bodies. But Philosophically, they didn't believe the body was important. They thought it was a drag on things. You, you will recall uh, the, the Athenian philosophers mocked the Apostle Paul in Acts 17 when he spoke to them on Mars Hill. They listened intentively until he came to the resurrection. And that's when they began to scoff. And the reason they scoffed is because uh, they were dualists. They believed that uh, the spirit is good the material is bad, and the body was bad. In fact, they called the body the prison house of the soul. And the ideal was to be freed from this body, to be a pure spirit. And so when he talks about the resurrection of the body, that was absurd to them. They had a 
low view of the material world and a low view of the body. But in the Bible, the body and the material world are good. Our, our great goal is the resurrection, a glorified body. We're going to live eternally in a new heavens and a new earth in glorified bodies in the very material realm for all eternity. But these are good. The material world, the body is good because they are God's creation and, and, and therefore they're to be used and enjoyed, but used properly. And that is how we honor the body and all that God has given to us. In verse 5, he, he qualifies what he means by living in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. A man who walks by the Spirit rules his body, and the same for a woman. Paul expresses that in athletic terms in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. He talks about how he deals with his body. He doesn't let it control him. He controls it. He disciplines his body. He makes it his slave. That's a, that's a constant struggle. He didn't let passions of any kind, lustful or monetary or any selfish passion, master his soul. And it was a constant struggle. Uh, that's what the Gentiles did not struggle with or struggle to do. They were characterized by lustful passion. They gave full reign to it. Paul explains all of this in Romans 1, verses 18 through 32, how it happens, how the Gentiles had the light of nature, natural revelation, but rejected it, rejected the God who is clearly seen in the natural realm, and as a consequence of their apostasy, they worshiped idols and then engaged in immorality. There's a progression there from turning away from spiritual truth to going into moral error. The Greeks celebrated sexual vice in their art and literature. The barbarians, those outside of the Greeks, the Gentiles who weren't Greek and didn't speak Greek, those are who the Greeks said were barbarians, they practiced it as well. That was, that was the Gentile world. And their religions were filled with it, with temple prostitution. And since so many of the Thessalonians were converted out of that, and since the acceptability of sinful practices have an influence on society, on all of us in society, he reminds them of their impropriety, the impropriety of such practices. But sexual immorality and deviance is not only improper, not only unlawful, it is dangerous. It invites God's retribution, His discipline. Verse 6, And no man transgresses, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. Now, to, to transgress means to step over. It means to overreach. And violating the marriage of a Christian brother, and that's what he's talking about, violating the marriage of another Christian is stepping over a sacred line to harm another Christian in the most serious way. Uh, it's, it's sin for anyone. It's sin for a non-believer. But violating a fellow Christian's marriage through adultery is especially heinous since he is a soul for whom Christ died. That, that's the reason Paul gave for not causing a brother to stumble, a weaker brother in Romans 15, verse 15, and 1 Corinthians 8, verse 11. Christ died for this brother. Now that's, that's not stated here, but it certainly is the impl implication here when Paul refers to this person who is offended, sinned against, as a brother. Well, if he's a brother, then he has been bought by the blood of Christ. Christ sacrificed for him. He purchased him. It's a serious thing to sin against such a person. But also, it has far-reaching consequences. It is catastrophic 
to a marriage and a family, and it makes a mockery of any testimony that the violator, the, the sinning saint, might have had with the world. But Paul's warning here is given in a different consequence, one that shows why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. It's not just that it's a bad testimony and wrecks a testimony, it's that the Lord avenges such sins. He punishes the wrongdoer, but he also avenges, that is, he defends the victim. He is just. He is the avenger of these things. That's sobering. Should be sobering. God deals with adulterers. The author of Hebrews said that. The end of the book, in chapter 13 and verse 4, he wrote, Marriage is to be held in honor among all. And the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. This has always been a problem. Christians wrestle with uh, the flesh and its powerful desires, but one incentive, one motivation for not giving in to these desires is God avenges such sins, and he defends the one who has been sinned against. And what would make the guilt all the greater in the case of the Thessalonians is Paul had warned them about this before. This isn't the first time he's made this statement. He has talked about that before. He said that, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. This is serious, he says. Paul keeps coming back to the fact throughout the letter that he had instructed them on doctrine, various issues before, or he'd warned them on uh, moral matters before. Paul was only in Thessalonica briefly for a few weeks, but he had given them broad instruction in both Christian doctrine and behavior. And he warned them earnestly about morality. God sees all. Nothing escapes the Lord God. And, and know this, that our sins will find us out. Now that's incentive to godly behavior for sure. Uh, to put it in um, an, an often used phrase, it's an existential threat. Sin is. Uh, it, it's a threat to our existence, and very, very, very much so. John, in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 16, warns about a sin unto death. It doesn't define that sin, and I take that to mean it can be any kind of sin with a particular person, but the result of it is physical death. That's God, how God deals with sin in the church. So that is incentive. But a higher motive is given in Paul's second reason for purity, stated in verse 7. It is the whole character of the Christian life. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. We are what we are only by the sovereign grace of God. If we are saved... If we are Christians, it is only because He called us out of darkness into light, from death to life. And that statement, God called us, is shorthand for He chose us unconditionally from all eternity. Then in time, He called us to Himself by the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the gospel. And we came, not because we chose Him, and we decided to move ourselves in His direction, but because He had already, long ago, from eternity past, chosen us, and through the Holy Spirit, in time, regenerated us and moved us to believe. Uh, what did He call us to? Purity, not impurity. That's the sense which Paul, uh, again, uses the word sanctification. We, we have been called to a sanctified, purified, morally clean life. So, 
moral impurity isn't an option for the Christian. He or she must reject it. Paul is telling the Thessalonians and telling us to behave according to the people we now are. We're a new creation in Christ. And we have new abilities and new desires. And we're to act upon that. Now again, sanctification is a process. And therefore, it, it is not completed in this life. It won't be completed this side of the grave. But this is the life we are to live today. The sanctified life. He called them in sanctification. That is the, the spiritual environment they were to live in. One of holiness, in an atmosphere as it were, of self-denial on the one hand and, and striving on the other. That leads to the inevitable conclusion of verse 8, which also gives the third reason for purity. Rejecting it is opposing the Holy Spirit. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but God who gives His Holy Spirit to you. If you reject what I'm saying, He's telling them, you're not just rejecting me. That's not the point. You're rejecting God. We don't live a holy life, a sanctified life, a, a life of separation from the world and unto God in our own strength. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. We have Him within us, literally. The third person of the Trinity dwells within every believer in Jesus Christ. He's there. But we can resist the Spirit. We can grieve Him. Paul says that in Ephesians 3, uh, rather, uh, 4, verse 30. Uh, and we, and we, we grieve Him by disobeying God's instruction. And here Paul says that, that uh, disobeying His instruction here is disobeying God Himself. That's not an option for the Christian. Sanctification and the sanctified life are God's will. And to bring the Christian back into it. And God never lets go of us. And because He's our Father, He never abandons us to these things. He's always leading us away from it, influencing away from it. To, to do that, to bring us back into the proper walk of life, He'll correct us by means of discipline if necessary, and harsh discipline sometimes if it's necessary. The reason is how we live matters. Words without deeds are empty. Faith without works is dead. If we are God's children, then He will discipline us for our good. But how much better to joyfully live obediently. That was Paul's lesson to the Thessalonians and to us. Glorify God in our bodies by gladly, joyfully obeying Him. It honors Him. It testifies to His grace before the world. And it is healthy. It's a blessing. This is not a cumbersome life that He's called us to. This is a clean life. This is a life of blessing. The moral life, the life lived on the straight and narrow, the life lived in obedience to God's instruction is a healthy and clean life. It's the best life. It's a blessing to us. So there is wisdom in the statement, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary use words. May God give us all the, uh, the desire to do that, to live a life that's honoring to Him, and also to preach with words to His glory. I'll end with the words that are to be preached. They are the good news that salvation is offered freely to the lost, to sinners, to the guilty, to all who believe in Jesus Christ. He died for all who do. He suffered the eternal penalty of sin in, the, in, in their place so that at the moment of faith, the believer is joined to Christ, accepted 
by Christ. Joined to his life and joined to his death, the penalty is paid forever and we are forever in him with eternal life. If you've not believed, come to Christ. Believe in him. Then live for him in the power of the Spirit, the best life and the clean life. May God help you to do that. Help all of us to do the things that Paul has instructed us to do here. Let's stand and sing hymn number 16 in the Songs of Praise book. Father, that is a great truth that Your Son, the triune God, loves us so and will hold us fast. We can never be lost. Not because of anything we've done, because of everything that He's done in our place. And by Your grace and mercy, You enable us to lay hold of it. And having done so, we can never be let go of. Thank You for that grace and that assurance. Bless us this day and this week as we live out our lives in this world that we would reflect Your grace and mercy to those around us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.